Well, good morning. How's everyone? It's great to see you today. I hope that you're doing well. I want to take a second and welcome you here, whether you're with us in the room right now or whether you're joining us live on the stream or a little bit later on Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, wherever you are, we're thrilled that you're here with us today as we are in the second week of January. Are you still writing 2022 on everything or have you made it to 2023? That's not just me, right, that does that? I'll get it right about halfway through the year, I think. But I'm excited to continue this series with you as we are taking a look at the early church and what they would have meant when they said being together, because we said last week that we pattern ourselves after the early church. So if we want to talk about being together, we need to take a look at what it would have meant for them. And can I just say this as I get started? I love Swiss Cove, don't you? I love Swiss Cove. I, it's a fantastic, fantastic body. I'm excited to be a part of it. But the church is a weird place, right? Am I allowed to say that? I guess it's too late now. The church is a weird place, and it's weird for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons that it's weird is that it brings together people who would never otherwise meet, much less spend time together, much less build relationship with one another. We see that, right? Like there's not very many places where you would gather with this group of people, like we would be in the same room, that we would hang out, that we would get to know one another. And I don't want you to be confused. When I say the church is a weird place, I'm not saying that as a bad thing, because weird isn't always bad, at least I hope not. Otherwise, I'm in big, big trouble. In this case, I think weird is beautiful. I think it's fantastic. And a few years ago, I'll give you an example of this. A few years ago, I found myself whitewater rafting in the Dominican Republic with Mark Green. Does that happen outside of church? I don't think so. I don't think so. And here's the thing. Mark, you're one of my favorite people. I hope you know that. And uh, Mark's one of my favorite people on the planet. And we became close on that trip. And the Dominican Republic trip is where our relationship shifted. Fair? Fair? And um, I remember we're sitting on that raft, and they put us in the front. I don't know why they put Mark and I both in the front of the boat, but they did. And when you first take off, if you've never gone whitewater rafting, they, they put you in this place where it's really calm so you can practice what to do when you get into a big rapid. And we were going to be going through some pretty decent rapids that day. So what happens is the guy yells, down, and what you're supposed to do is jump out of your seat and jump into the bottom of the boat and sit like this so that if the boat starts moving around, you won't get tossed off to the side. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but Mark and I, neither one are little, okay? We're not little people. And so they put us in the front of the boat where the boat is the narrowest. And so what happened is they said, the guy yelled, down! And we went, whoosh! And my shoulder was slammed against Mark's shoulder, and my other shoulder was wedged so tight against the side of the boat, there was no chance we were moving. And Mark and I started laughing hysterically because we couldn't get up. We started, we're like wiggling around, trying to get unstuck and back into the seat. And after what felt like a long time, but was probably like, I don't know, a minute, we wedged ourselves out and we got back up on the seat and we're dying laughing. And we looked at each other and said, man, I hope this boat don't flip because we ain't getting out, but we're going to drown. So I ain't going to fall out of this boat, but that might not be a good thing. Thankfully, uh, it didn't flip because we're both here and alive today. So we made, it, we made it. We became close over the course of the trip, not just because of the whitewater rafting experience, but we had a lot of deep conversations on that trip. We got to know one another on a much more personal level. We served alongside one another. We had some experiences that changed who we are as people And over the course of that week, our relationship shifted. See, we went from being friendly to being friends. And you know there's a difference, right? Between being friendly and being friends. You know what it is? It's we love our friends. We love our friends. We don't have to love people to be friendly to them, do we? That's kind of like baseline manners. Be nice. Be friendly. But we love our friends. And we sacrifice for them, don't we? We might not sacrifice for somebody that we just sort of know, or maybe we don't know, but we'll be friendly to them, but we might not necessarily sacrifice for them. Because we can be friendly with somebody and dismiss them from our minds the moment they leave the room, because we might not even ever see them again. 
They're not really a part of our lives. We're just nice to them because they're in close proximity to us. But, but we think about our friends often, don't we? We know what's going on in their lives. We keep up with them. And we run into a dilemma when we unpack this idea of being together the way that the early church was together. We come to this problem because, see, as, as churches in America today, we get, we get really excited and we think we've really, we're really hitting it out of the park when people come to the church building and they leave and they say, man, that's a friendly church. That's a friendly church. And don't get me wrong, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. We don't want to be a mean church. But is friendly the goal? Because you know what I never read in Scripture is, um, I never read Jesus calling us to be a friendly church, or at least to stop there. You know, I noticed Jesus didn't say, they'll know you're my disciples because you're friendly. And so this month, as we take a look at the birth of the early church, the birth of the church is in Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2 if you're with us. In the Version Bible app, you can check out that live event and follow along with us. But we said last week that we're centering this whole conversation around the word together. But then last week, I said, I think there's three words that kind of summarize what that means. Do you remember what they were? They all start with B. Believe, belong, become. Would you say those with me? Believe, belong, become. Last week, we spent a lot of time diving into what it means to believe. We talked about how to become a Christian and how to begin growing as a Christian. We said we're not going to be content to remain spiritual children any longer because our beliefs spur us to action. Our beliefs push us to grow. And when we start growing, we start becoming connected to a community of believers. Yes, we belong to Christ, but we also belong with one another, don't we? We belong to we belong together. We belong to one another. And when we look at the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2, we see what happened immediately after. The beginning in Acts 2, verse 42, here's what we read. It says, They, the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were what? Together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They went well past friendly. They left friendly in the rearview mirror a long time ago. See, they didn't just meet together once a week or once every four to six weeks, as is the normal in American churches today. They didn't just show up when they were on the schedule to do something. They didn't just show up when planning center said, you got to come. They didn't just show up when the weather was not too nice, but not too bad, you know, not so nice that you don't want to miss it, not too bad that you don't want to drive in it. That's not what happened. They didn't just show up unless there was a game they really wanted to go to or a concert that they couldn't miss or a whatever. You see, church was not an event that was added to the calendar that could be pushed if something more interesting or exciting came up. They weren't showing up to an event. They were showing up for Jesus. They were showing up for one another. They understood that church isn't something that you show up to. It's who you are. And if they didn't show up, that part of the church was going to be missing. They were together. They had everything in common. They sacrificed for one another. They sold their property and possessions to take care of one another. They spent time together in one another's homes. They were well past friendly, weren't they? They were friends. You might even call them family. So how did they get to this place? How did they get to the point where they were willing to sacrifice so deeply for one another? Why were they spending every day? Why were they spending so much time together? Well, the short answer is they were following a direct command of Jesus. And some of you are like, I don't really remember that command. I want to show it to you this morning. Are you ready? 
It's in John 13, 34 and 35. Here's what it says. A new command I give you. This is Jesus speaking. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you what? Love one another. By this, everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. Those are strong words, aren't they? I mean, because to understand what he meant, you have to understand how he loved. So how did Jesus love them? Well, he showed up for them, didn't he? Came from heaven to earth. He showed up for them. He served them. He served with them every day. He shared his life with them. And ultimately, he gave his life for them. So when Jesus said to them, I want you to love each other the way that I love you. They knew what he meant. This was a high calling. And so they started living that way, loving as Jesus had loved them. And shock of all shocks, people were drawn to that kind of love. The Lord was adding to their number every single day those who were being saved. And that shouldn't surprise you at all that this was happening. Because wouldn't you want to be a part of something like that? I mean, think about it for a second. If you knew that there was a group of people that met regularly and these people would sell their house to take care of you if that's what was needed, they loved you that much, you'd show up too, wouldn't you? You'd want to be a part of something like that because you don't get that anywhere else. You don't see that kind of love every day. People are drawn to the love of Jesus. So let me ask you, do you love people like that? Let me rephrase Do you love each other like that? Do you love the people in this room like that? Jesus said, it's your love for each other that matters. It's your love for one another that counts. This is how people are going to know that you follow me. If you love each other the way that I love you. Not if you're nice. Not if you're friendly. But if you love each other the way that I've loved you. Let me ask you, do you want this church to grow? Not rhetorical. Do you want this church to grow? Yeah, I do too. Just, I want to get it out there. We're all on the same page. We want the church to grow. I'm not content to stay where we are. Okay? I want to see more people and more people come to Christ. It's not about filling this building. It's about seeing people coming to the kingdom of God. I want to be very clear about that. But you know what's going to grow this church? It's not going to be a dynamic message every week. Though, I promise you I'm going to do my best to deliver one of those. I'm going to spend time studying in the Word and do my best to share with you what God's sharing with me in a way that's memorable and dynamic and accurate and applicable to your life. I'm going to do that, but that's not, that's not what's going to be the difference maker. It's not going to be the best worship, passionate worship. It's not going to be cool lights. It's not going to be the best kids programming or Wednesday night dinner or women's ministry or life groups or any of those things. And I'm not saying that those things aren't important. I'm not saying they don't matter because I think they are important and they do matter and we're going to keep doing them and we're going to do them the very best that we can do them. I'm just saying that's not going to be the difference maker. Why? Because programs don't grow churches. Love does. Programs don't grow churches. Love does. It's love for one another. You know, it's been said that the church can't compete when it comes to programming, and I think that's probably true. We're not going to compete with Disney when it comes to programming. Fair? Regardless of what you think about Disney, they got the programming thing down, don't they? Their budget is always going to be bigger than ours is, and that's okay. They're going to have better programming than we are. Oh, listen to me. Disney cannot compete with the church when it comes to love. They cannot love the church because there is no substitute for the love of Jesus. The relationships that we are supposed to have with one another in this place cannot be found anywhere else on the planet. But here's the thing. If you're only showing up a couple of times a month, if you're not serving, if you're only showing up when you're on the schedule to serve, you're coming in late, sneaking out, early, if you're not in the life group, you're never going to experience what I'm talking about right now. It just won't happen. 
Sure, you'll experience some good programs. We're going to do our best to make sure that they're good. You'll hear the apostles' doctrine. We're going to preach it every week. You'll get to break bread together with us in communion, but you'll miss out on what it really means to be together. You'll miss out on being together, truly. You'll miss out on building the kingdom. So what am I asking you to do? I want you to belong, to believe, to belong, to belong to Christ, to belong to one another. You need to join a group. You need to begin serving. And some of you just went, oh, here we go. You want me to get involved in one of your programs. You just said it wasn't about programs. And the next thing you said is you want me to join your programs. I thought it wasn't about programs. Here's the thing. I want you to join a group and start serving, not so we can build better programs. We don't care about that. But so we can build the kingdom. I want you to join a group and start serving, not so we can build better programs but so we can build the kingdom. That's the mission of the church, is it not? To build the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is made up of people, of people. So we need to be connected to one another. We need to belong together. You'll grow the kingdom when you start living like Jesus did, when you start loving like Jesus loved, when you show up for people, when you serve them, when you serve with them, when you share your life with them. This is going to change you. I'll just tell you up front. It's going to change you. It's going to change them. It's going to cause all of us to stretch and to grow. And people will be drawn to the love of Christ. The world will know that you're a disciple of Jesus when you start loving each other the way that he loved you. The world will know there are disciples in this place when we start loving one another this way. But this is going to require us all to show up, to show up consistently. It's going to require us to invest in other people, to love them well, to sacrifice for them. Listen, if you want to move past being a spiritual child, this is what it takes. It's what it takes. And I'm not going to lie to you. It's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. But here's the thing. What you're going to find on the other side of that sacrifice is a family unlike anything you've ever experienced before. You'll find people who've been where you are and can help you. You'll find people who are where you've been and who need your help. You'll find that place that you belong, that place that you've been looking for this whole time is right here, is right now. The kingdom has come, and we aren't going to miss it, church. We aren't going to let this moment pass us by because it's raining outside or because there's a football game on. We have the opportunity to gather together as a family in the presence of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I'm not letting anything stand in my way. We're going to show up. We're going to show up for Jesus. We're going to show up for each other. We're going to show up for each other here on Sundays, in our homes, throughout the weeks, in the hospital, if it's necessary. And wherever there's a need, that's where we're going to be. Why? Because we want to fill the building? No, because we love each other, because we belong together. I know God's going to grow this church. God's going to grow this church when we start loving each other like that. And listen to me, they don't make buildings big enough to contain that kind of love. They don't. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pay off this one. You good with that? We have $1.5 million left on this building. We've got to refinance in eight years, but we ain't going to wait that long. We're going to pay it off before we need to refinance, okay? We've got a $12,000 a month mortgage. It takes $13,000 a week to do what we do around here. I don't know if you know. But here's the thing. When we start sacrificing for one another, if it, People in this church die that doesn't even blink. That mortgage goes away. And I want you to think about this. In the meantime, what we're going to do while we're paying off this one, we're going to start raising up ministers, raising up church leaders. Why? Because the goal isn't to just have the paid off building and they're like, oh, we made it. No, no. The goal is to plant more churches and send more people out. I'm not talking about campuses of Swiss Cove because we're not here to make the name of Swiss Cove famous. We're here to make the name of Jesus famous to the ends of the earth, amen? And so I've been talking with the elders. We're gonna sunset the capital campaign. Uh, That was supposed to be a three-year campaign and it's gone on for more than 10 years, but that doesn't mean we're going to stop tackling the mortgage. We're actually gonna double down and go after it harder, but it's gonna require 
sacrifice, church. But our goal is not to just pay off the building. It's to plant more churches so that the name of Jesus can be spread to the ends of the earth. That is why we're here. That's what we're about. We want to share the gospel with as many people as possible. And I believe that God wants to add to our number daily those who are being saved. And we are not going to stand in the way. We're not going to selfishly hoard this love that God has poured out upon us. He's called us children of God. We're not going to keep that to ourselves. We're going to share it freely. We're going to love one another the way that Jesus loves us. And when we do, when we start loving like that, the world will know that there are disciples of Jesus in this place. So I just want to ask you, church, you ready for this? You ready? We've got work to do. Time to believe, to belong, to become. Let's get to it. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for being with us in this place. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for bringing us together. God, help us. Help us to love each other like you've loved us. And God, we can't wait to see what you do next. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.